This episode of The Curbsiders is sponsored by Pediatrics On Call, the new podcast from the American Academy of Pediatrics. Each week, hear the latest news on children's health with advice and tips for doctors and parents alike. Subscribe to Pediatrics On Call and visit aap.org forward slash on call. The Curbsiders are now partnering with VCU Health Continuing Education to offer CE credits for physicians and other healthcare professionals. Check out curbsiders.vcuhealth.org for more information. The Curbsiders Podcast is for entertainment, education, and information purposes only, and the topics discussed should not be used solely to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any diseases or conditions. For the more, the views and statements expressed on this podcast are solely those of the host and should not be interpreted to reflect official policy or position of any entity, aside from possibly cash like moral hospital and affiliate outreach programs, if indeed there are any. In fact, there are none. Pretty much, we are responsible if you screw up. You should always do your own homework and let us know when we're wrong. Paul, this was a good one. We we just finished a just, it was just a packed episode on hyperthyroidism with Dr. Eve Bloomgarden. Um, but Paul, before before we get to that, tell the audience, you know, what do we do on this show? And if you want to, what is the meaning? What is the meaning of life, Paul? I asked you so many times and you've never answered that question. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I've given you the same answer every time, which is... Um purely for nerds to appreciate i think i give you the answer 42 yeah i don't get um, that i gotta i need yeah, to read more i mean <laughs> or just or just google man i mean the world's your oyster buddy <laughs> but just to remind folks who may not know we are the internal medicine podcast we use expert interviews to bring you clinical pearls and practice changing knowledge and and boy what an expert interview i know i say this every time but really truly i mean it this time not that i don't mean it the other times but we have such an expert and such an interview and you're going to tell us all about both right and our producer tima karganov he's a med student at uconn he did a great Great job putting this one together. Our guest for tonight is Dr. Eve Bloomgarden. She is a board certified endocrinologist and clinician educator at Northwestern University, but she is a Philly girl at heart, which is why Paul and I like her so much. She received her medical degree from NYU and completed her training at the University of Pennsylvania, and her clinical expertise is in thyroid disorders and thyroid cancer. She loves spending time with her husband, who is also a physician, and their two young children. The pandemic has brought out her social media voice and her skills as a social connector in her role as the chief development officer and co-founder of Impact, which we talk about towards the end of the show. So definitely listen for that. On this episode, we cover tons of stuff about the thyroid. We talk about that you should call it thyrotoxicosis until you know what's causing it. Uh, We talk about the exam, how to examine the thyroid we take a really just wonderful detour talking about thyroid eye disease, which I did not know much about. And we get through pretty much everything that we could think to ask about thyroid. It's a fantastic episode. So without further ado, please enjoy this conversation with Dr. Eve Bloomgarden. All right, Eve, thank you for joining us. Can you give the audience a one-liner about yourself and include a hobby that you have outside of medicine? I sure can. Thank you, first of all, so much for having me. So I am a um, mom of two little ones, a wife of um, an oncologist and an endocrinologist. And I love uh, science fiction, magic, singing, and boxing, mostly against a punching bag and not against a person. I'm also the co-founder and chief development officer of Impact and a contributor to Docs Who Rock on Twitter. And I live in Chicago. So much there, Paul. I don't even know where I don't even know where to dig in. So I'm going to throw it to you. Wait, I, so I, I mean, I'll ask my usual question, but the Docs Who Rock thing, obviously. So what was what was your last foray? Because I feel like I've not seen that. I'm, I may have missed you as part of that feed. Oh my goodness. Well, this morning um I did a, a Lizzo song. Um just a couple seconds to to um change the words to I have my mask on instead of, you know, I do my hair toss um <laughs> to model my mask. And then um we I just did something from Rent and uh it's show tunes week. So we also I re- repurposed my lame is I dreamed a dream. And stay tuned for Hamilton mashup. <laughs> I'm shocked ha- that is not happening. Hamilton, I- we're recording this just before Hamilton is going to come out on Hamilton. On Disney. That's why we're doing it. <laughs> okay. I kind of, <laughs> I'd like to go to my grave having never seen it. I have to admit, like I, <laughs> now it's just a matter of like I just I just want to be that guy. I think um, it's not worth it. <laughs> you're probably right. Let me <laughs> so 
let me ask the question that generates um, maybe the most anxiety for our guests. If you could give me a book recommendation, I would love a science fiction book recommendation, but no pressure. But any any book that you want to recommend um, to add to the pile of things that I should get around to reading at some point? Sure. So um, I actually wasn't sure about the science fiction part of it. So I um, was going to recommend a book um, that I have for my children. Um, it's called After the Fall, How Humpty Dumpty Got Back Up Again. And it's actually a Caldecott Award winning book um, for children about not just the Humpty Dumpty falling, but what happens when he gets back up, how he conquers his fear of heights so that he can reclimb up the wall and kind of the struggle that he goes through and ultimately how conquering the anxiety in the wall kind of sets him free. And it was a book recommended to us to help our kids adapt and adjust to COVID-19. Sounds tremendous. Where how, when is he put back together again? Because I feel like that would be an important part of the healing process. <laughs> so, that- you know, I had the same um, problem with the book because, of course, they couldn't put Humpty to back together That's again. What I'm yes. But so it's a little bit changed. They do put him back. He's just not back really well. And so he has to do a lot of physical therapy. He um, has to really limit his exercises. It takes him a while to really even, you know, get to the store. There's a lot of anxiety and physical and mental. Um, but ultimately, they do put him back together, and he moves on. It, I love it's it. It's really it good book. It's, yeah, no, it sounds like an amazing metaphor. And you're changed, so you're not the same afterwards, but yet you're, you're different and perhaps better at the end. I love it. And I'm halfway through a book called Circe, which is the goddess um, uh, Circe, also one, the witch from um, uh, Homer's Odyssey. It's uh, her perspective. I'm only halfway through, so I can't tell you what it is, uh, how it is at the end, but so far, it's fantastic. Well, speaking of Humpty Dumpty and him picking himself up, putting himself back together, can you tell us about a time during your your rise to becoming an endocrinologist that you struggled with something and hopefully overcame it, what you learned from that? Sure. So um, I think it's mostly, instead of one episode, I would call it little like micro episodes of failure where I get in my own way um, as a sufferer from imposter syndrome that, um, you know, really has been a struggle for me for, um, for, for a long time. And so really it's what I've done is to try and redirect my focus on, um, reminding myself that imposter syndrome is a syndrome and is not a personal failure per se. And, um, I've, I've been spending a lot of time in the last few years, just trying to, um, improve on myself and self-awareness, self, um, confidence And actually, I developed something that I call my awesome list, which is actually a list that I have on my phone, which actually my daughter stole and left the room with. Um, But it's all of the things about me that um, I think are awesome. And so I came up with some of them. Some of them are compliments from others. But when I'm feeling really kind of down or, you know, when feeling kind of like, you know, nothing's going well, I look at my awesome list. And I've shared that with many friends and colleagues. So now I have... uh, a couple of other people also with the awesome list and you guys are more than welcome to have one as well. Thank you. Paul, if you need any suggestions, I can really, I can really help out there. I, I may need a lot of help coming up with my own <laughs> awesome list, but I, I appreciate that offer. Thank it's you. okay to ask for help to get your awesome list. Yeah. Uh, I think that's good practice probably as someone who doesn't give them, uh, doesn't give themselves a lot of credit for being awesome. Uh, I probably should, I probably should develop an awesome list for myself. That might, that might be in order. Well, I mean, you could start it with the podcast. The, the podcast, yeah. Thank you, <laughs> thank you. You've con- you're you are the first contributor. Yes. The Curbsiders are sponsored by Pediatrics on Call, the new podcast from the American Academy of Pediatrics. Some of you have made the decision to provide medical care to children, and God bless you for doing that. And since you do, this podcast may help you do it even better. Each episode will discuss issues like obesity, mental health, safe sleep, and keeping children safe while they're trapped at home during this current pandemic, and maybe even when they're not in the midst of a pandemic. Um, (laughs) TBD, I guess. Visit aap.org forward slash on call for the latest episodes. So uh, did you have any quick advice for the audience before we get to a case? Um. Advice in general, I, guess I would say, I would... like, yeah, favorite advice, uh, more career oriented stuff. Sure. Um, so I think one of the things that I tell my fellows all the time is, um, is not to shy away from asking the big questions about, um, 
life, about happiness, about job decisions, really to, to find the faculty members or the colleagues or friends that they really trust and then to kind of let it all hang out. And I do that in a very intentional way because I think I spent a lot of time kind of throughout training just trying to be the right way, um, you know, and follow kind of the, the unwritten rules of medicine. And I think I, when I did have ultimately open up to the faculty members and my mentors and sponsors who um, were invested in me, it was just a world of difference in terms of how much I grew and how much I learned. And so I'm trying to instill that in my trainees earlier so that they don't, um, they don't miss out on any opportunities that they would have otherwise been able to get. So we are going to move into a case here. And Paul, did you want to, did you want to read it? Sure. And I, well, we had sort of even an introductory thing that we can sort of talk about. So even before we delve into the case, we, I'll, I'll remind uh, our listeners that we had what was almost certainly a Peabody award-winning episode on hypothyroidism <laughs> um, and how to diagnose and management. I, I, I wonder if you couldn't sort of, again, just sort of walk us through the interplay between TSH and T4 and T3 and free T3, because I feel like just all those levels, I think just right from the get-go provide consternation and confusion and sort of the differences between hypo and hyperthyroidism in terms of those measurement, and then maybe we can get into the case itself. Absolutely. So when we're measuring thyroid function, the most important test is the TSH. So it's the single most sensitive, most useful um, initial diagnostic test if you are suspecting thyroid dysfunction. And the TSH, again, is not the thyroid hormone directly. It's from the pituitary. So a high TSH means that your body thinks that there's not enough thyroid hormone around. And so the volume on the pituitary is going up. So I say, you know, as the TSH goes up and up, gets to 20 or 30, the volume's going louder and louder, the thyroid's not responding. And so primary hypothyroidism would be a high TSH, high volume, but the thyroid's not working. And so it's a primary thyroid issue, and that's having um, hypothyroidism. So you'd have a high TSH and a low free T4. So the opposite is hyperthyroidism or thyrotoxicosis, which is the general umbrella term if you don't know the cause of the lab pattern. So what that means is that you have too much circulating thyroid hormone, free T4 or T3, and that is feeding back to the pituitary. And so the volume is down, the volume is zero because the pituitary already knows that there's too much thyroid hormone around. So you'll see a TSH that's zero um, or lo that's low, and then you'll see elevated free T4 or T3 levels. You can also see a pattern where the TSH is low and you have normal T4 and T3 levels, and that's called subclinical hyperthyroidism. Overt hyperthyroidism is a low TSH with an elevated thyroid hormone level, so free T4 and T3 or one or the other. So really, it's just about pituitary volume sets the stage. So uh, low TSH is the trigger to investigate for um, too much thyroid hormone. Eve, I wanted to ask about the total versus free thyroid levels, because when you go to order them, sometimes I just see people checking off all of them and <laughs> it seems I like, know. it seems like that's not necessarily the best practice. So what's the difference? Which, when do we need to order total thyroid hormone levels? Sure. The majority of the time you're just going to order TSH, but if the TSH is, let's say, um, let's say it's low and you want to know why, that's when you would order the free T4 level or free thyroxine level and then a total T3 level. So the free T3 assay is just not very good. It's very prone to um, error. We don't use it as much. It sometimes tracks. And so we'll see sometimes in the ER a free T3 level, but we always add on a total T3 level because it really... Um, gives us a lot more information about the severity of hyperthyroidism or thyrotoxicosis. So if you check a lab um, and it's the, and you check a TSH and it's low, then you would want to then go ahead and check a free T4 and a total T3 as your next set of investigation um, into whether this is transient, persistent, or progressive thyrotoxicosis. So now I think Paul can get to that case and that we could, we could work this through some examples. And I have to say, kudos to the producer and the scriptwriter. Uh, just a plus name for this case. For once, <laughs> I, I finally approve of it. So we're going to talk about Ms. Jody Bass. She's a 35 year old woman. She's coming in uh, with reports of weight loss. She also feels maybe some heart palpitations, and she's checked her pulse. And maybe it's been a little bit fast. Maybe she's been a little bit sweaty. She's not been able to sleep real well. And this has been going on for about the past three months. And being an astute clinician, of course, you you think anxiety, but then also. This being our hyperthyroid episode, we're also suspicious for hyperthyroidism. So I guess 
the, the question that we'll start with is, is Ms. Bayes' presentation typical or I guess more broadly, what are sort of common presenting symptoms of hyperthyroidism? Sure. So um, again, I would emphasize we would call it thyrotoxicosis until we know what the cause is, because that's really, um, it doesn't imply um, endogenous thyroid hormone production. It kind of encompasses both spillover, such as um, a thyroiditis or endogenous production. So thyrotoxicosis. Um, but this is a, a perfect case presentation for somebody with thyrotoxicosis and something. And I see a case like this many times a day, um, you know, uh, as a thyroid specialist. And so the typical triggers in the history here that you would at least be thinking about thyroid levels would be her age um, and the fact that she's coming in with weight loss, tachycardia, and insomnia. Those are pretty classic thyrotoxic symptoms. It would be, I think, difficult to find another explanation. <laughs> I'm, I'm a little thyroid centric, but for me that that is, you know, classic presentation. The other things we would want to for sure um, ask about would be periods, whether she's having regular menstrual cycles, make sure she's not pregnant. And then from there, you would really kind of want to dig into the etiology of what was going on here. And even before you had the labs back, there are some clues um, on physical exam that may point you towards one or another um, diagnoses. And so we can get into the exam if you if you want to do that. And I would just say the other thing that I always think of, just this is just where my head goes when someone's coming in with these kind of vague multi-system complaints is like, are you taking something? So I'm always like, are you are you on some sort of weird pre-workout supplements or mm-hmm. Uh, absolutely cocaine, you know, things like that. <laughs> right. Sure. Perhaps the best workout supplement. Yeah. So, you know, that's fair. And in, you know, I, I will say we, we require a referral. Um, and so there has to already, you know, we, we, are very biased in, in that we know the TSH is oh, already yeah. not, you know, abnormal. Um, having said that, you know, I'm a thyroid doc, I see thyroid everywhere. So, um, yes. I would never have thought of anything else, but and certainly we're it's giving, true. We can still talk about case. exogenous thyroid hormone intake. No question that has to be on the differential um, uh, as well. Okay. I guess even before we get to the physical exam, I might ask, is there a setting in which you would just screen for hyperthyroidism? Like here we're sort of in diagnosis land, but are there patients where where a screening TSH um, just to pick up thyroid disease would be appropriate? So um, that's a great question, actually. And the answer is yes. Um, So certainly not universal screening, but somebody um, with a strong family history of thyroid autoimmunity, somebody with other autoimmune conditions, if they have type 1 diabetes, if they have Addison's disease, vitiligo, all of those things kind of make me think about autoimmune polyglandular syndromes. And so I would really want to make sure because thyroid autoimmunity is so much more common than all of these others. Celiac is another one. I would always check their TSH um, in those situations. If somebody has Hashimoto's or Graves, I don't necessarily check any other autoimmune markers for those uh, because thyroid disease is so much more common, but I do check the reverse. Before we move to the exam, Having a differential diagnosis for thyrotoxicosis, what are some other questions that you might ask that are going to lead you down like the different paths of the differential? Absolutely. So let's say it's, um, you know, we're in the middle of a viral pandemic and we're doing a phone consultation with somebody and we can't see them or examine them at the moment, but we want to figure things out. So that that's kind of the the best way to think about it. So I would ask, um, first, I'd want to know any history of thyroid disease. Have they ever been treated for any thyroid problems before? Um, or were they on methimazole and somebody forgot to reorder it, you know, during admission? Um, do they have a neck scar and are they, you know, prescribed Synthroid and the dose is wrong. So lots of kind of just basic history questions. And then we get into questions about do they have um, any neck pain or tenderness so that when they when they touch their neck, does it hurt? Do they um, do they have any trauma to the neck? There, there's certainly, um, you know, vigorous pal- palpation and or, um, you know, strangulation injuries, traumas that come into the ER, we see that. Um, more common things are medications. Are they being treated with a medication that can cause thyroid dysfunction? So amiodarone is a big one. We see amiodarone induced thyrotoxicosis. Um, lithium can do it. Uh, we see a lot of immune checkpoint inhibitor induced thyrotoxicosis um, or thyroiditis followed by hypothyroidism. So the um, PD-1 inhibitors and the CTLA-4 antigens. And so especially in combination, we see a lot of thyroid dysfunction. 
Did they just get a big iodine load? So a contrast scan that that can definitely uh, precipitate hyperthyroidism in in certain cases. And then you want to know symptoms, right? So then you would kind of walk through if they if these are incidental lab findings with no clinical manifestation versus are they coming in with palpitations, atrial fibrillation? Do they have osteoporosis? Um, you know, kind of the the clue that this is maybe not just a, a new finding, but that there's a clinical consequences of kind of persistent thyrotoxicosis. So you can get a lot from the history, you know, and obviously you ask a 35 year old and a 75 year old, very different questions, but you know, it's also the difference between inpatient and outpatient a lot of times. So on the outpatient side, you would want to ask again about menstrual irregularities. You want to ask about trouble swallowing or visible enlargement of the anterior neck in the mirror. You want to ask not necessarily palpitations and tachycardia because that doesn't mean um, not, that doesn't mean a lot. But you, what you want to ask is, are they aware of their heartbeat? You'll, I, I often will hear um, that when someone's laying down, going to bed at night, they just have an awareness of their heart beating, which is not, um, which is new for them. You want to ask about weight, weight loss, weight gain. Um, you know, we think typically with hyperthyroidism that there's weight loss, but often there's a concurrent increase in appetite, so that you can actually you can actually gain weight or maintain your weight just from your um, increased caloric intake. Um, you want to ask if any if there's any eye discomfort. So if there um, is pain or pressure behind their eyes, if they have excessive tearing or double vision, if they can't close their eyes, you want to ask if they feel like there's a sandy or gritty feeling in their eyes. That's a pretty um, good question to uh, unlock Graves' um, ophthalmopathy. And then uh, the just the way that they look, do they did they notice anything different? Um, so those are kind of the big questions that we start with based on the clinical scenario and situation and the age of the patient. I wanted to come back to the contrast induced because I hadn't really heard of that one. Can you give an example of what sort of proceed is that like after a cardiac cath and then what's the time course and is it very transient or does it, I'm just Mm, wondering if I've seen this and missed it before. So um, probably you probably it ha- you have because it's not it's not rare, but it's essentially um, after any CAT scan with contrast. So you know um, PE protocol after a cath, we see it all the time, um, and basically iodine can induce hypothyroidism or hyperthyroidism, and so it's if you have an autonomous nodule um, or a functional nodule that basically is fed by the iodine fire, and then you give it an iodine load, you're going to precipitate thyrotoxicosis. It can actually even trigger a thyroid storm. So let's say you have a hot nodule, and then you give it a source, it's going to make more thyroid hormone. Whereas in Graves disease, if you give somebody actually an iodine load, they'll transiently have an improvement in their thyroid function, um, because iodine will treat the mechanism of um, in Graves' disease, with a hot nodule, you'll actually feed the fire. So it can be um, immediate, um, you know, it, usually within like a day or two um, at, the, at the longest, but um, we will ask about it because you don't necessarily check TFTs, right? Paul, I'm racing you to find out which one of us can diagnose that first. <laughs> so for example, when I have a patient with a hot nodule or with, with a toxic adenoma or, or a toxic multinodular goiter who I'm getting ready for treatment, I will counsel them not to get any iodinated contrast studies until after we have treated them because they will uh, they will definitely get worse. And if, you, um, if they are going to need to go for something, you give them like you beta block them first or something? So it, I, so you would probably give them um, uh, methimazole. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. We're we're jumping a little bit ahead to treatment, but that yeah. uh, that just piqued my curiosity, Paul. And, what, that what, one's, and while we're while we're down the side alley, I have to ask in terms of the like the traumatic or palpation thyrotoxicosis. Mm-hmm. Same same sort of question. Like, what is the how common is that? And what is the timeline that you see? Like, is it just a transient phenomenon, or is it? Or do guys so, definitely the extent of the trauma? It, it is. Um, it, it is not common, but it's certainly there are lots of case reports. Um, I, the most dramatic case that I have ever seen was a gunshot wound through the um, neck. Wow. And so, and that was in someone with underlying Graves disease, where actually the medical student noticed uh, this, this person's eyes um, in the trauma bay. And they were in thyroid storm. Um, it was it was really amazing um, because the, the, this person also had gunshot wounds through other GI sections, so um, couldn't give them anything oral. There was no access. Had you know 
it, it was so that was the most dramatic I've ever seen. Yikes. Um, it, you can give PTU rectally. So, you know, there are ways around it, but it's a thing. I would say it's probably not something everyone's going to see. Wow. I would like to talk about the, <laughs> we're, we're, we're there already a little bit. I would Who like knew? to talk Endocrine about Endocrine was so much fun, right? I, I, we knew. That's why we invited you on. <laughs> we knew you were going to be a ton of fun. I, I'm, I'm mostly interested in talking about the physical exam and specifically the eye findings because I feel that they're pretty prominent and feeling the thyroid gland is is a little bit tough and we have ultrasound readily available now, but the the lids, please tell us about that. Sure. So um, things like lid lag and stare are um, basically all, all things that kind of increase your sympathetic drive. So thyrotoxicosis and hyperthyroidism and other cocaine, pheochromocytoma. I mean, you, you may see it at this anyway, and it's basically if you have um, somebody follow your finger and you lower it slowly, you're going to see the whites above their above their eyes, you know, you'll be able to see it all the way down. And that is um, not normal. It's symp- sympathetic overdrive. So that's the lid lag. Um, and then the stare is basically just kind of a stare. So they're kind of, they're not blinking as frequently as uh, you would otherwise blink. And it is noticeable um, when you're talking to them. So that's very different than the Graves ophthalmopathy, which is really um, more of a proptosis. So a bulging anterior kind of forward facing orbit, you'll see kind of a uh, circular kind of more domed protrusion of the eye. Uh, patients will notice um, that their eyes look different. Um, sometimes they can't close them fully. They'll be, um, we call it chemosis. They, they'll be red and injected. And it's, it's just a very different look. It's not a sympathetic overdrive. And you can have Graves ophthalmopathy without being thyrotoxic or without being hyperthyroid. And so it's really about behind the orbit in Graves as opposed to um, just the uh, hyperthyroid state causing the lid lag in the stare. I see. And let me make sure I'm understanding. So the, mm-hmm. so it's just purely the sympathetic stuff that causes the lid lag and the stare, but exactly. the, so they're not blinking as much. And and when they're, when you have them look, look down, you can see the whites of their eyes and you should really only mm-hmm. be able to see their, their pupils and their, um, iris, right? Not correct. Not the whites. So if but, you were to, so if we weren't virtual right now, you, my lid, my, uh, the upper eyelid would be covering the top half of my iris, right? So, yes. um, whereas somebody with a lid lag, you're going to see the white between the lid and, and the iris. And the iris. Perfect. And then the, the Graves ophthalmopathy is mm-hmm. where the, there's glycosaminoglycans involved from what I remember. And mm-hmm. there's just extra tissue in the orbit. So there is, um, it's actually, there is, um, the, there are TSI and TSH receptors that are on the fibroblasts that sit behind the orbit, and um, you get deposition in those areas. So there's, you know, pr- there's protrusion because there's buildup behind the eyes. It's not actually in the eyes, so it's in the extraocular muscles, and then um, in the in the tissue behind the eyes. And so that is just happens to be that there are TSH receptors there, and it's the same thing that causes dermopathy, actually, which is um, a specific kind of rash on the shins. It's, it's the pretibial mix edema that's the same antibody receptor or the TSH receptor is sitting there and the antibodies cause that uh, complication too. So it's really antibody mediated and not related to the thyroid function levels. Um, so Graves' eye disease can happen before you develop hyperthyroidism, during the hyperthyroid process or after. I have patients who develop thyroid associated orbitopathy, which is another word for Graves' um, 20 years after they were treated with radioactive iodine. So they'd been hypothyroid. They were fine. No eye issues. They were treated for Graves decades ago, and then they developed Graves eye disease. So it's really a separate process that's, um, that is uh, the antibody mediated. Since we're here, and I'm not sure where else to put this question. So <laughs> you, know, you mentioned even sort of the, the gritty sensation might be a hint that there might be Graves orbitopathy. Mm-hmm. I guess just because, and we'll talk about this, it may impact the ultimate treatment selection. How clinically apparent is orbitopathy? Like if you if you confirm hyperthyroidism, should that warrant a referral to ophthalmology or is it something that just a schmo like me should pick up an examination or exactly how 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 do we know for sure whether or not we're not missing it? Yeah. So anybody with Graves disease, um, I send for a baseline ophthalmology exam. So, you know, they want, we want baseline measurements uh, with the X ophthalmometer. You know, we want to know, we want a baseline for future comparison and we want them plugged in. 
I think, um, you know, as somebody who sees this all the time, it's usually pretty obvious to me, but it, it can be somewhat subtle. And, you know, you really, I look at the eye from all angles um, and I, I can usually tell, but it's not always obvious. And sometimes I'll ask a patient, well, do you, do you have the same eyes as your mom and your sister or, or is this different, right? Because some people just have big eyes and there are patients that come in to see me for some other condition and their eyes are so prominent that I will sometimes check TSI antibodies. And, you know, I think it's uh, something that takes some practice, but when it's, when the patient has, you know, just dramatic proptosis and, or optic nerve damage, or they can't close their eyes. I mean, that's, that's not subtle, obviously. Um, But I send everybody for a baseline ophthalmology exam. The Graves eye disease, when you, when you find someone that has it, do you counsel them? Is there any part of it that's reversible? Yes. So that's a great question. So um, the only modifiable risk factor that um, we have um, is is smoking. So if you're a smoker, that will absolutely worsen the the eye disease. And it's a a powerful motivator to counsel people to quit smoking because um, really the, the eye disease in graves is probably the worst part of graves for a lot of people. It can be really disfiguring. It really... um, has a big impact on quality of life. And a lot of uh, times people will come in and that's their biggest, you know, concern. I'll see people who say that they don't go outside without glasses on, um, you know, sunglasses on no matter what. So, you know, I think of being able to modify that, I tell them to avoid smoke, like it's the plague. I, I tell them basically, like, if you somebody is smoking, I want you to cross the street, like, just don't go anywhere near it. And then the other thing that we will do for mild, um, for mild ophthalmopathy is give selenium, Um, There is some data, and this was uh, a New England Journal article of 2012 um, about selenium for mild um, graves ophthalmopathy, and six months of selenium at 200 milligrams uh, a day is did have a significant um, improvement in graves ophthalmopathy. Now that was done in Italy, where there's potentially more selenium deficiency. Um, I'm, I'm actually not sure if we have that data yet for the U.S., but there's really no downside to doing it, and so we will do a six month course of selenium. And now we finally, as of 2020, have something, um, have treatment for Graves eye disease. It's tepratumumab or tapiza. So this is a game changer. um, And I'm very excited about it. And it actually has been, the, the data looks really good for really reversing Graves eye disease. That's this awesome. Is, what a delightful detour this was. <laughs> yeah. Um, thank this you so much for spending time with us. Absolutely. I, this is one, I'm very helpful. passionate about this for my patients. I think. So let's. Yeah, you want to bring it back I, to I'd the like case, to, Paul? Oh, okay, go. Yeah, ahead. I'd like to actually because because I like physical exam stuff. Like we did not mention actually the thyroid exam yet, which seems like it yeah. might be important for this. Good. And then anything else like um, like tremor or hyperreflexia or anything else that is particularly useful during your examination. But do talk us through your thyroid exam and what's important there. Perfect. So I start. So my thyroid exam starts at the door, right? So um, I, I like to think of myself as um, a vampire. I'm always staring at people's <laughs> necks. Um, and so I will see a thyroid if it's big. I'll see it across the room. But so you know. You know, it's really while they're talking, I'm looking at it. But when I'm trying to examine the thyroid, I have a very particular way. I actually um, use my thumbs and I stand in front of the, the patient. Usually they're sitting on the exam table and I'm standing. I'm pretty tall. Um, and so um, sometimes I'll bend down a little bit, but I use my thumbs and I start really superior in the neck. So basically right under the hyoid bone. And I am doing very light, gentle palpation little circles trying to separate the skin from the glandular tissue that's just right underlying the skin. So I walk my thumbs down all the way past the cricoid and the thyroid cartilage until I feel this kind of like boggy, squishier region. Um, And it can be just sitting right here in the anterior neck. It sometimes is more inferior, but you can feel a change in consistency. I'm touching very lightly. So I will often have my students or my um, the residents or fellows examine a patient after me and I have the patient say, tell them whether they're pushing a lot harder than I was. And if so, they back off because I'm, it's a really gentle, I have no idea why there's like, we, we teach students or we used to, you know, pull this out of the way or push until you, you know, feel the trachea. Cause then you, you basically miss the entire thyroid. Um, and so that's where I start. And I always close my eyes. It just enhances my kind of sensation input from my thumbs. And so I can really get a much better sense of things with my eyes closed. For somebody with an enlarged thyroid gland, 
I will use sensory input of my whole four fingers and I'll wrap my fingers kind of around the front of the neck. Again, very, very gentle just to try and kind of manipulate the anterior gland to see what, um, what I can pick up that way. If there's anything that's a little firmer, anything that um, feels nodular, anything that feels stuck, you know, a lymph node, something like that. And then I'll, I'll walk to the other side of the patient, wrap the other fingers around the other way and just get an outline of the neck. And then in order to um, assess for a thyroid thrill, I will um, take these, my three, um, my three or four fingers, not my thumb, and I will basically lay it across the entire gland as lightly as possible. I'm barely touching and I'm looking to feel, the only way I can describe it is a mini dialysis fistula. It's like a brr, brr, right? But it's really, really, really light. It's very subtle. And so you cannot be pushing harder. You're going to miss it. But if you feel that that's Graves disease, there's nothing else that does that. So that's kind of like the whole story there in terms of if you get, you know, a diffusely enlarged thyroid gland with a thrill, you, you know, the diagnosis. So that is my thyroid exam. And then the, for the, um, tremor, I have patients take their hands, hold them straight in front of them, spread their fingers apart and close their eyes. And what I'm looking for is this kind of very, very, very subtle shake with, um, I'm looking for a fine tremor of outstretched hands with their eyes closed so they can't override it. If I'm not sure, I'll have them either take a piece of paper or a pen and put it in between their fingers and do the same thing and see if the paper starts to shake. And that's a really um, good way to elicit this fine tremor of outstretched hands. For reflexes, um, I use my fingers. I don't have a reflex hammer. I don't, I don't really find it useful, but I just tap on the biceps reflex. And what you're looking for is a very brisk upswing. And that's um, a finding that you'll see in hyperthyroidism. So I do um, biceps and I, I just kind of make sure they're, I, I say, go loosey goosey for me if they can. And then we just tap their biceps muscles. And then the other thing about a Graves patient that you'll notice is it's almost like being around a manic patient sometimes where they're kind of, they're, they're a little bit hard to, um, you know, to pin down with story and they're kind of talking really fast and you, you start talking fast because it's, you know, contagious. And if you start having that feeling, they're probably hyperthyroid. Um, and so it's really, um, it's kind of a good internal checkpoint to like, why am I talking fast and running around the room too? Cause they have, I mean, that's actually kind of my baseline. <laughs> <laughs> Mine too, but don't tell. And then I also, I'm, I kind of cheat because I also have an ultrasound in my office. Um, and so um, e everyone that I'm evaluating for thyroid disease, I lay them on the table. We do a thyroid ultrasound. Um, and ultrasound is really a key diagnostic test, in my opinion. I mean, I can tell you, right, if, you've, if you're thyrotoxic and then you have a big nodule, I'm going to talk about scanning you, right, to see if you have a hot nodule. If you have... Um, hypervascularity um, on ultrasound without a nodule, it's really, if it's Graves, we call it the Graves Inferno. The entire, um, the entire Doppler view is just all blood vessels. It's all, you know, it's, it's um, so vascular, you can't see anything else. And there's nothing else that does that. So I use the ultrasound as part of my physical exam. And is that Inferno just replaced the, the brewery? Yes. Uh, the Inferno is um, exactly, it's, it's the visual for the brewery. I could have not sworn, everyone has ultrasound. And and I could have sworn the last time I had a patient with Graves who had a, a pretty big goiter that just listening over top of their thyroid with my stethoscope, I heard like a really loud brewy and I was I was so delighted. Absolutely. <laughs> so I, I'm I'm so I'm just excited great. for you because you won't forget that, right? So no. absolutely. Um, you know, and it's you, they have to hold their breath and sometimes they're a little too tachycardic to really under, to, to really be able to elicit that. But again, I mean, if you have the, that's, um, an ultrasound probe, I mean, you know, it's a win. You, that's, that's kind of the whole story there. I usually do. I'll have to start messing around. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, our ultrasound is now. really nice. We can see the crowd and the ID. I mean, you know, it's, it's better than the MICU one for sure. Um, but I use that as, uh, for my thyroid cancer patients, thyroid nodule patients, thyroid diagnostics, um, all of that. Paul, I think we should go back to the case and and talk about so Jody Base here, she's worried. She has we think she has thyrotoxicosis. We checked a uh, we checked a TSH, we checked a uh, T4, a free T4 rather, and a total T3, and those are all coming back. So she has a low TSH, a high free T4, and a and a high total T3. So what would be your next step here? Are there any, uh, is there any other blood work you would want to get? And uh, is there any imaging you would want to get? 
Yep. So um, again, if this were if, if this patient were in my office, I would um, have the diagnosis based on storied exam and ultrasound. Um, but let's say we didn't have that, or let's say um, this was primary care office, I would recommend as the next lab test to check a TSI antibody. Um, that's a thyroid stimulating immunoglobulin. And it's, um, it, it is an immunoglobulin stimulated increase in, in uh, cyclic AMP production. It's measuring that. So it's actually measuring the stimulated activity of the antibody. So it's a bioactive assay, um, as opposed to the older thyroid binding immunoglobulins or TBIIs. The TSI is really um, my, my go-to antibody measurement. Um, because when if that comes back elevated, you know, diagnosis clear, but also um, I track TSI antibodies over time because as we, um, if someone has Graves and I'm treating them with antithyroid medication such as methimazole, I'm not going to stop their methimazole until they clear their antibodies. Otherwise, um, they uh, will re- will go back right right back into it. We know the risk for recurrence um, is is tightly correlated, and the timing to recurrence is correlated with whether their antibodies were high or had cleared prior to stopping methimazole. Are there any other medications or supplements that we should be mindful of when we're actually running these lab tests that might potentially interfere with them or kind of throw our, our results off? Yes, I am so glad that you asked that question. So. Um, the biotin story. So biotin became uh, very, very popular and I think very inexpensive. And um, so all of our labs switched over to being biotin sensitive the same day that the biotin was added to all of our supplements. Um, so it was a really a perfect storm. And essentially biotin at doses that are advertised for hair and nail strength and health are so far above the recommended daily allowance. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable, right? So 70 micrograms is, I think the, um, the RDA for biotin, and these are five to 10 milligrams. And so TSH, unfortunately is an immunometric assay. Um, and it's, uh, a sandwich assay, and it's biotinylated. So what happens is biotin binds and prevents the antibody from binding. And so you get a false low TSH. So a TSH that could be less than 0.01, for example. Unfortunately, biotin also interferes with our competitive assays, which are the free T4 and the total T3. And the competitive assay is gets a false elevation in the setting of biotin. So what you get is graves, basically. You see an undetectable TSH, a high free T4, and a high total T3. Now, this is something that, you know, actually was causing a lot of chaos in the thyroid world. As you can imagine, people were um, diagnosed with Graves' disease and put on methimazole um, because this pattern was so dramatic. And I can say, for example, a patient that I met recently had a that exact lab pattern, a TSH that was undetectable, free T4 of 4.9, you know, where upper limit of normal is 1.5, and a total T3 of 500. Um, But this person walked into my office with no symptoms, did not have thyromegaly and literally had no signs or symptoms on exam, nothing. I mean, you would just think, are you just the most stoic person I've ever met or what's going (laughs) on? And um, it turns out this person was taking biotin. We stopped it for two days, repeated the tests, and they were all normal. The other problem with biotin is it also will increase your TSI. Oh, geez. (laughs) So and thyroglobulin, if you're you know measuring that for cancer, so it's really wreaked havoc on the endocrine in the endocrine world. Um, so our lab actually has a comment um, now in every thyroid lab lab, and there are other hormones that biotin affects as well, parathyroid. Um, but um, it has a comment that biotin will interfere with this assay, and so um, patients now can see that on their portal. And all of my patients, there's an auto kind of print out at the end of my after visit summary that says hold all vitamins for at least two days before your blood tests. It's chaos. It, but do you get a sense that it actually does help with hair and nails? I'm just out of curiosity. <laughs> so, you know, hair and nails go through. You don't have to answer that. <laughs> no, 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 I will. I, I would love to answer this because the answer is that there's no way to know because hair loss is for the most part a stress response. It's going to get better anyway. Same with nails. And so there's no way to know because time, you know, tincture of time will have probably fixed it anyway. I have not met any miracle um, improvements with biotin, nor have I met anyone who's stopping their biotin had a dramatic worsening in their hair and nails. But Great. thank you for that. I <laughs> wanted to change up our case just a little bit. And yeah. Say, let's say the TSH is low. Um, we, we, we check the TSI antibodies, but they're, they're really not 
like we, we don't find any, so we're not sure exactly if this is Graves or not. Mm-hmm. Would you? Can you talk about the radio? Uh, yeah, the uptake scans. And sure. are there different kinds that we need to be aware of? So thyroid scintigraphy, which is, um, you know, ra- you basically wanting to know the 24 hour iodine uptake. And also you want a picture of what that looks like. And so what that is, is, um, diagnostic I-123 scan, which is a, um, an tracer that is not radioactive, but it emits, um, um, you know, a particle that we can capture with picture and with a, and we can measure. So in somebody um, who you aren't sure of the diagnosis and you don't have an ultrasound or the ultrasound is inconclusive or there's a nodule there, you want to know, is this Graves with a cold nodule? Is this normal thyroid with a hot nodule? Or is this thyroiditis? Then um, thyroid scintigraphy will help you out there. And so it's um, the patient comes in one morning, takes um, gets a capsule of I-123, a low dose. They swallow it and um, they do a four-hour uptake and then a 24 hour. So that's kind of the whole story, Um, you know, and you should be able to tell. So if there's increased uptake um, and if it's homogeneous, so if the picture is, um, looks like a butterfly and the uptake is above the upper limit of, you know, eight to 25%, let's say it's 50%, there's nothing that could be really but graves. Let's say the uptake is zero. There's that's thyroiditis, right? Or, or someone just got a big iodine load. And so the thyroid's full. Um, and so you would want to make sure that that the patient's not on amio or didn't just get a contrast scan before you ordered that. Um, but in general, thyroiditis would have zero uptake because what th- what thyroiditis is is just spillover of preformed thyroid hormone. And um, you know the thyroid can store a lot of thyroid hormone in it. So you know we, we that can kind of linger for four weeks, six weeks. Sometimes we'll see eight weeks um, of of thyrotoxicosis um, before that gets better. Typically, um, you may get, I forgot to mention this, you may get a, a history of a recent viral infection in somebody with painless thyroiditis. You, you definitely want to ask about that. We're certainly seeing painless thyroiditis in amidst COVID as well as subacute thyroiditis, which is a pain, more painful. Um, we also see um, subacute thyroiditis coming in waves um, for other viral infections. I saw a slew of them last summer. I want to say like 25 cases or something, um, which was the most I'd ever seen in my life. And that was all the same story of just really painful um, anterior neck that kind of moved around the neck and uh, thyrotoxicosis. Wow. So you want to ask about that? Yeah. The thyroid's awesome, right? I, I want to make sure I understand mm-hmm. the imaging algorithm because sure. it, it sounds like in your office, you have access to the ultrasound. So if you see like a pretty homogenous gland with lots of blood flow, you're probably not going to need the uptake scan unless you right. think you see nodules there. But if we're in the primary care office, would you recommend we order and we don't have ultrasound available to us. Mm-hmm. Would you recommend we order an ultrasound first before we send them for the, like the iodine uptake scan? So I think that's a good question. And it, it, I usually would recommend sending an antibody level first. Yeah. Um, and, um, we, there is such a thing as antibody negative Graves disease and that in that situation, um, the uptake is going to be really helpful. There are some caveats to the uptake, which are, um, can't do if somebody's pregnant. Um, and you definitely can't do if somebody is lactating or breastfeeding, um, all of the iodine will go straight to the breast tissue and you won't be able to see anything. Um, you can't do it if someone just had a contrast study and you often don't need to do it for, you know, a really obvious history, but I, I think it's a totally reasonable option in particular. Um, if you feel a lumpy, bumpy or nodular thyroid gland. And so the key thing about the thyroid scintigraphy is you cannot diagnose nodules using scintigraphy. You need to also have the ultrasound. So I'm never going to say the ultrasound is a wrong thing because you're going to probably need it anyway. Um, But, um, you know, sometimes we can tell on ultrasound without doing thyroid scintigraphy. And sometimes you need both, especially if you're going to see like an antibody negative Graves disease. I mean, there's no other way to, to really tell. I probably order two or three diagnostic scans a year, you know, for example, um, compared to the millions of ultrasounds and antibodies. Okay. Well, can I just ask, just, just to have them said out loud in terms of when we're sort of working up initially thyrotoxicosis, is it helpful to have, because it seems like there's about a bazillion causes of it. <laughs> I don't think a lot that the general internist is going to necessarily pick up one. Like, is there a top three we should just kind of have in mind before yeah. sort of going way, way down the algorithm or sort of just giving up and throwing them in endocrinology? Absolutely. So, I mean, 
in terms of thyroid toxicosis, you want to think about Graves' disease, you want to think about thyroiditis, you want to think about functional or hot nodules. And those are the big three. So um, again, history is a huge piece of this physical exam. And then ultrasound is going to show you if there's a nodule there if or not, and it may show you Graves' disease as well. You know, before you get into the weeds on any of these medication induced things, I, I would say those are the three and, you know, younger age groups, you're going to see more Graves, older age groups, you're going to see more nodules. Um, in um, certain times of year, you may see more thyroiditis. But again, the thing about thyroid disease is you're going to check it once, you're probably going to bring them back in anyway, and you want to see if it's persistent, or if it's already gone away. Because um, if it if you find a lab abnormality that corrects itself with tincture of time, you know, then in hindsight, you can say that was thyroiditis, right? And then you just want to watch and make sure they don't swing into hypothyroidism, which they often will, but it, it's usually... Um, you know, I would never make a diagnosis and start treatment based on just a one-time blood test unless it was so unbelievably abnormal in the right setting with the exact exam that I was expecting. But we almost always repeat things. That's kind of what endocrine, you know, we say, check it again. Um, and so, <laughs> you know, just to be sure. And so you may actually get your answer with the repeat numbers anyway. And, you know, if you're really um, not sure, I mean, this is the exact reason to, you know, this, this is one of the endocrine things that really can't wait 12 months to get into our clinic, right? I mean, this is something that has to get addressed sooner than later. Certainly, if, if somebody's pregnant, you, we, you know, I, I would not just say manage that, right? We should know about it. Um, and HCG also is another cause of TSH suppression and um, gestational thyrotoxicosis. And so, you know, if you're trying to figure out, is this gestational and normal or it's Graves' disease, what do I do? This patient's in their, like, you know, three to five weeks pregnant, like page your endocrinologist. We will, we will take that. We will see that patient, you know, that day. Um, and that, that's, I think, the other important take-home point. If you're suspicious of thyroid storm in the hospital, like, we'll come in, you know, that is, that's kind of what we do, you know, and I, these are things that are more urgent and emergent things that um, we do kind of sit and think about all the time, or at least, you know, I do. <laughs> <laughs> I want to bring it back to Jody. So we've gotten, we, we got the thyroid, the TSI antibodies and they're positive. We're pretty sure this is Graves. Our, our ultrasound also is supportive. There's blood flow everywhere. We heard a brewery. We were very excited. And I have a question when you're counseling a patient about the, the, the drugs like methimazole or PTU, why does it seem that there's such an adherence problem? Maybe this is just my sampling bias, but I, I seem to have met several patients who just like do not enjoy taking those medications mm -hmm. or they're like, oh yeah, I took them for a while and then I stopped them. I just didn't feel like taking them anymore. Yeah. So there's a lot, there's a lot of reasons. First of all, I will say PTU and I are not friends. I don't like PTU. I don't <laughs> use PTU because there's a fulminant, you know, hepatic failure warning, black box. You see one liver failure who needs a transplant who just had Graves disease and you don't use it again. Um, having said that in thyroid storm, or if you're really, really have to treat in the first trimester of pregnancy, we will sometimes use PTU, but otherwise only, only methimazole or carbamazole in Europe. Um, so the adherence thing, I think, is multifactorial. Number one, when you meet somebody who's overtly hyperthyroid and you counsel them on how to take a medication and what, how to monitor it, you can assume that you're going to need to do it again in a couple of weeks. So I um, bring my Graves patients in um, every four weeks until you thyroid, basically. And I also have a very clear, I have a couple of smart phrases that get printed out that basically goes through this is your medication. This is why you're taking it. This is the dose. This is the date of your next labs. These are the reasons to call me. So methimazole carries um, a risk of agranulocytosis, which is, you know, an acute uh, loss of your uh, white blood cells and your neutrophils, which is clearly an emergency, especially um, in the setting of, um, you know, a viral pandemic, you really don't want to immunosuppress people, um, but even in general, and it's, it's one in 500, one in 600 patients. So, you know, um, rare, but not not completely rare. So everybody gets the um, methimazole rules, I call them. I have a smart phrase, it's just called like Eve's methimazole rules. And it, it pulls in fever, sore throat, stop your methimazole, get a white blood cell check, call us when you're on your way to the lab. And our phone number is on there. And then um, they have to be admitted if they have a granulocytosis. And so the, everybody gets that printout every single time I see them. And so I think that's the that's the biggest reason. I think compliance is a just the nature of hyperthyroidism, and B is um, 
uh, just not having enough repetitive kind of uh, counseling on it. And the dose actually, you know, needs to be adjusted pretty frequently too. Um, the other thing is uh, BID dosing is is just, you know, it doesn't work for, for a lot of, especially for hyperthyroidism. If somebody's prescribed BID, I usually just assume they're only taking it once a day. What's the typical dose for meth- methimazole? Yep. So um, it depends on the degree of hyperthyroidism and the size of the thyroid, but typically I try and I try and use the lowest dose that I can. Um, there's a study showing, or a couple studies showing that if your free T4 is over seven, then a dose of 30 milligrams of methimazole or higher does have a benefit in terms of rapid restoration um, to a euthyroid state. But under that, and free T4 of seven is very high. Um, you know, range goes up to 1.5. So yeah. um, under that, really 15 milligrams, um, occasionally 20 milligrams total um, is really all the dose that you need. Um, and then it's kind of like easing up on the break. So every time, if, you know, if the levels are stable on one dose, I will usually inch down the dose a little bit more. And then if they're stable, I'll inch down so that somebody's on a much lower dose for maintenance than they were initially. This is once daily dosing or you split it? Well, I, I do once. Da- so, so occasionally if somebody's really, really hyperthyroid, let's say that I get a call from the lab and their T3 is over 700 and their free T4 is over seven and their TSH is zero. Um, I may start them on BID just for the first couple of weeks. The reason being it's really, um, it's, it doesn't last a full 24 hours. It lasts like 14 uh-huh. to 15 hours and you want them, you don't want them waking up with kind of, you know, um, severe tachycardia. But, um, after that, I usually am backing down to once a day. And for the most part in my outpatient clinic, it's, I'm doing once a day. Are you also putting them on symptomatic control with like a beta blocker? And if so, any specific beta blockers that you recommend? Yeah. So this is a great question. Um, the, um, the question of beta blockade is, um, really about what their symptoms are and how dependent they are on their tachycardia for cardiac output, right? So somebody who has a compensated tachycardia, who is reliant on that rapid heart rate, they're not going to do well with beta blockade. And so you really want to make sure that they're hemodynamically stable and they're not, there's no evidence of heart failure. You know, if they have, um, JVD and edema, I'm not, I'm not going to beta block that person. You know, you can see cardiovascular collapse. Um, in the outpatient world, somebody who is just uncomfortable and jittery and anxious and young and otherwise healthy, I will beta block them um, for symptom control. And um, usually I use a tenolol because it's once a day and it works well. It's usually you're going to need it maybe for four weeks, you know, just until the methimazole really kicks in. Um, on the inpatient side, or for somebody with severe, you know, I guess only inpatient really, propranolol has kind of always been touted as the one to choose. And the reason is because high doses of propranolol can um, inhibit conversion of T4 to T3, but you need high doses. It's like 200 milligrams a day, which is much higher than like what you would otherwise use. And um, so really in somebody who is impending thyroid storm or thyroid storm, you want an esmolol drip if you're going to beta block. I mean, that's, that's really the answer. You don't want to mess around with anything long acting um, or anything that's going to precipitate cardiac collapse. Um, and you really, in, on that, when somebody's that sick, you want an echo, you want to kind of know, and you probably want central access um, and you know, uh, monitoring their hemodynamic state. But esmolol is my go-to in that situation. A tenolol on the outpatient side transiently. If somebody's already on metoprolol, it's fine. That's good enough. And some people just, they don't need a beta blocker. They're, they're, they either have mild hyperthyroidism or they're tolerating it well. And then um, it's certainly not necessary if they don't have symptoms. I will also use a beta blocker for um, uh, symptoms from thyroiditis or just the thyrotoxicosis um, just for symptom control. We're not going to block um, thyroid hormone production with methimazole because that's not the underlying pathophys, but um, they may need a beta blocker as well just for transient thyrotoxicosis. Yeah, that that brings up a good point. With thyroiditis, they're spilling thyroid hormone, and in that case, you can just treat them symptomatically with beta blockers. But with right. grades, nothing you can do. You can't yeah. shut off the it's shutting off the synthesis isn't going to make a difference to the what's happening. And with Graves. You want to shut down production with methimazole or PTU if they're first trimester pre- pregnancy. Mm-hmm. Are there any other conditions where you use methimazole or are some of the other, like what if someone has a yeah. hot nodule, 
Is it the same so thing? You can absolutely. So if somebody um, has, so if somebody has a toxic adenoma and they're overtly hyperthyroid, meaning their TSH is suppressed, their free T4 is higher, their T3 is high, you'd get, um, you know, thyroid scan and it's just one big black circle and the rest of the thyroid is whited out. You know, that that's the perfect person that you're going to treat with radioactive iodine because you're, you're going to be able to target uh, all of that radioactive iodine to the hot nodule and kill it off. It's just an autonomous nodule. And the rest of the thyroid will start working for the most, you know, in most cases. So if that person though, is either not going to tolerate iodine or, um, is symptomatic and you just want to get them take cooled off, sometimes we'll pre-treat even, then you may, you can use methimazole there. The difference is that that person's not going to be, is not going to go into remission, um, with, uh, methimazole with, um, because they have a, a nodule that's hyperfunctioning as opposed to Graves, it's an antibody mediated disease. So if you clear the antibody and, um, then they can go into remission, you're not, there's no antibody to clear with a hot nodule. The Does body just, right. The body just clears the antibody. It, 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 it produces it for a yeah. while. And then sometimes it just goes away. Exactly. And sometimes it doesn't. And so, um, you know, they, we used to say, um, treat with methamazole or PGU for 12 to 18 months. If somebody's not in remission, then they need to do definitive therapy with either thyroidectomy or radioactive iodine. We are now, um, a lot less, um, I would say hardcore about that because it turns out you can be on low dose methimazole um, and do very well indefinitely. And maybe you'll go into remission in a few years, maybe you won't, but the risk of agranulocytosis really falls off to, to zero when you're on a low dose maintenance. Like I have people on 2.5 every other day and it keeps them euthyroid and under control. Oh. Um, and so, you know, that has probably changed in the last few years where, you know, I really, um, I really do a lot more uh, methimazole long term than I do other definitive things. And there was actually just a paper that came out um, this year in thyroid, kind of showing what endocrinologists have been doing recently. And it speaks, it holds true that a lot of us are doing the same thing. The cases where I will jump straight to surgery or to uh, to radioactive iodine, um, I, with the caveat, I don't use a lot of radioactive iodine because it can worsen Graves' eye disease. Um, and so it unfortunately can bring that out and you can get pretty severe orbitopathy um, post uh, radioactive iodine. It's not a guarantee and certainly it's more common not to, but it is a big risk factor. And if someone has active eye disease, actually iodine is contraindicated. And so I will use iodine if somebody just wants this one and done and doesn't want surgery. If um, they have no eye disease and they're thinking about pregnancy, maybe in three years from now, but not in the next six to 12 months. If they are tolerating their hyperthyroidism, because radioactive iodine takes a while to work. So, you know, it can take two to four to six months to really fully, you know, kick in. Um, those are the cases I'll use iodine. I happen to work um, at a center with fantastic thyroid surgeons. And so I probably send more people for thyroidectomy than on average in the country. And I think that's okay. You really don't want to send people for thyroidectomy unless you do have a very experienced thyroid surgeon on hand because the risk of complications in somebody who's not a high volume thyroid surgeon is, is pretty high. Um, and it's higher for some reason in grave thyroidectomies than thyroidectomies for other reasons. Um, but for, let's say somebody comes in and they're diagnosed with graves and they want to, they're trying for pregnancy in the next six months, I'll probably send them for surgery or at least present that to them. They don't want them on with them as all. And I would like them to have the best chance of just getting this taken care of right away and letting them kind of move on with their fertility plans. And I can do that because I have the luxury of, of working with really good thyroid surgeons. And so I, it's not unusual that I do that. The only other thing was, and I had this come in from uh, another resident, first year resident who was asking about uh, just monitoring for post surgery or post ablative care, like if 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 there's anything like that. Now, since you're not doing radioactive iodine as often, ablation therapy as often, I guess like you don't have to go through that. But I just had somebody who was a resident who was asking me about that. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, so post radioactive iodine, again, it takes a while to work. So I'm, I monitor TFTs pretty closely um, every two weeks initially. Um, I want to see A, if they are going to become overtly thyrotoxic and, and they can have a transient worsening in their thyrotoxicosis. And sometimes we resume methimazole. Um, and then I want to know when they cross over into hypothyroidism. So if I'm treating Graves, I'm actually treating with the goal there, they will be hypothyroid. And so you don't want to miss that. Um, you don't want someone to going into myxedema coma because you 
ablated their thyroid and missed them going into. So this happens um, oh. and it can happen quickly. Um, and so um, I monitor them very closely after iodine. Obviously, immediately after surgery, they no longer have a thyroid gland. And so um, they get put on Synthroid right away or levothyroxine. You don't want to miss that either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good tip. Uh, subclinical, <laughs> this is probably going to be the last last thing we sure. have time to get Actually, into. Actually, an important point. Yeah. Subclinical hyperthyroidism is out there. I know you worry with that. Like, is this person going to develop arrhythmias or osteoporosis? What's your threshold to treat that and how do you handle it? So this is a great question. This is actually really important because um, this comes up all the time, I'm sure, in primary care and in our clinic. So um, subclinical hyperthyroidism is defined as a low TSH with normal free T4 and T3. So it's a di- it's a biochemical diagnosis. There are really no symptoms, but we can see sequelae of that. So what we see is actually um, in older adults, we see a three times an increased risk of atrial fibrillation with subclinical, with persistent subclinical hyperthyroidism. So not that, not if it's transient and we always recommend first checking it again. So, um, you know, if you check it on day one and it's not normal, but at three months it's normal, that's not the same thing. But if it's persistent, then we we do worry about atrial fibrillation. And so um, the recommendations for treatment are really based on age and other risk factors for arrhythmias. So if you also have COPD or you already have cardiac dysfunction or um, you know other other things that may precipitate AFib, you, you would want to be, um, you would want to treat. And sometimes I'll treat with methimazole, even though it's not curative, if it's a low dose. And sometimes, um, if we find a functional or hot nodule, we will treat with, um, with radioactive iodine. And then you have to make sure, cause if somebody has subclinical, they're probably not um, going to have a completely suppressed background thyroid. So you probably are going to make them hypothyroid if you give them iodine. So then you have to treat that and monitor that appropriately if, with levothyroxine and make sure you're not over or under treating. Um, the other thing is everybody that I see for osteoporosis, I do check a TSH to make sure they don't have subclinical hyperthyroidism as a secondary cause of osteoporosis. And we do see an increase in bone turnover um, from thyrotoxicosis or subclinical, and we see an increased risk of fractures. And so that's another reason that you may or may not decide to treat. Sometimes um, sometimes it, that's it's a tiny contributor and you know there's some other reason um, that for osteoporosis. And then sometimes I would just treat their osteoporosis and maybe, maybe not treat them with methimazole. Um, but often other times it's reversible once you fix the, the thyroid problem. Eve, I wanted to ask you for take-home points. This has been fantastic. It's probably going to be hard to pick just uh, two or three, but if you could give some take-home points. So I would say the biggest take-home point for the thyroid for hyperthyroidism, one would be get a really good history because that's going to really influence how you um, make a diagnosis. Um, two would be um, get a, do a good physical exam with a thyroid exam where you're really getting the sensory input from your hands and really just appreciating how the gland feels, um, whether there's any activity um, that, that you can appreciate um, and take a look, you know, at their eyes and other uh, more sensitive indicators. And then number three is maybe getting getting more comfortable with bedside ultrasound. Um, if you're already looking at, at the neck veins, kind of slide it right over to the anterior neck. You can't miss the thyroid. And maybe number four is ask about biotin. Okay. <laughs> so final question is, can you plug something? I know I know you have a great organization you're involved with, and I'd, I'd love to hear a little bit about it. Sure. I would love to. So um, I um, am a a part of a group that is um, called Impact, and it's um, Illinois Medical Professionals Action Collaborative Team. And we are a group of physicians that came together at the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. And we kind of came together um, based on our uh, what we were witnessing and hearing from friends around the country, we kind of organically formed to try and synthesize information in real time and 
put it out there for our colleagues, for our friends, and for the public to um, to really help uh, guide the narrative on what was going on um, with COVID. And so we have partnered with many different groups um, in Illinois and across the country to work and fight the infodemic is what we call it. We've written multiple op-eds. We've written lots of letters to the governor. We've worked with our local schools. Um, we um, are featured uh, every other week. Um, we do a Facebook Live uh, with one of our partners. We currently have um, a petition um, that we are working on for, you know, for a, a national mandate for masking. Um, and we're really just kind of um, we, we've come together to really uh, try and, and guide the course of the virus, at least in Illinois, um, locally, and also trying to help our friends across the country. And so we're all parents um, of young kids. We're all physicians in um, at multiple different institutions. And we would love to have people check out our website, see if they want to if they want to collaborate with us or to learn more about us. Our website is at Impact. 4HC, so impact the number 4HC for healthcare.com. We also have a Facebook page as well as a Twitter account and Instagram account. As part of that, we're do we have impactful chats where um, two of our partners um, interview somebody every week that's doing something interesting for in terms of the the pandemic. We have a blog that currently um, we have a new blog editor, and so we are inviting submissions. So just check it out. It, it, it's been it's been a really interesting couple of months. We will link to all of that in the show notes. Thank you so much. We'll let you get back to your family. Hopefully, you can chase your daughter down and find what where your cell phone find is, your phone. or hopefully not. <laughs> right? It's okay with me too. <laughs> yeah, it might be nice to take a little break from the technology. All right, sounds good. Enjoy Philly. Say hi to my parents for me. I will. I will. It sounds like they're right down the street. So they I'll... sure are. Oh my gosh. Stay well, you guys. This was so much fun. This has been another episode of The Curbsiders, bringing you a little knowledge food for your brain hole. Yummy. Non-committal, but, but there. Um, get your show notes at thecurbsiders.com forward slash podcast and sign up for our mailing list at thecurbsiders.com forward slash knowledge food to get our weekly show notes in your inbox. And we're committed to providing you with high value, practice changing knowledge. But to do that, we need your feedback. So please subscribe, rate, and review the show on Apple Podcasts or send an email to thecurbsiders at gmail.com. Special thanks to our producer for this episode, Tima Karganov, and to our social media team, Beth Garbs Garbatelli on Twitter, Mad Dog Maddie Morgan on Instagram, and Chris the Chew Man Chew on Facebook. Until next time, I've been Dr. Matthew Frank Watto. I'm Tima Karganov. And we would be remiss if we did not thank the great Stuart Brigham for composing our theme music that you're hearing in the background right now, as well as thanking uh, Claire Morgan of Notterly for editing our audio. And as always, I remain Dr. Paul Nelson-Williams. Thank you and goodbye. And thanks to our partner, VCU Health Continuing Education, who's helping us offer free CE credits for physicians and other healthcare professionals. Check out curbsiders.vcuhealth.org for more information.